One learning I had with Builtin Public is if you're not doing well, nobody cares or they're laughing at you. If you're doing well, you're leaking secrets. What you want though is to create content that looks like carbohydrate but packs protein inside. We do like more than 150 million views a month now in English content, right? You can't buy that. You can't remake that with capital. In the long run, people will prefer to watch more AI generated content than real content. Something with a story, it works. I could have presented this deck one and a half years ago, but I was like, first, let us use this to make progress, then show people. So in March 2023, I was thinking about what I should do next. What kind of company I should build. And I already had a channel and we had some views on the channel. And I said, I wrote something down. And I wrote it as a bunch of WhatsApp notes. And I said, this is how we should build it. This is how we should grow, etc, etc. And as you've all seen, we've grown a little bit now. So I thought, I wrote it and I know not many people read writing. So I said, fine, I'll make a video about it. And maybe it's useful to people who are watching. The deck is titled, and the article was titled, The Company is an Organism. Because I've run companies now for 10 years, and more than that. And this new distribution first business, it felt like a living entity to me. right? And I know that sounds like crazy work, or some, something that a crazy person says. But if you follow along with me in the deck, and you suspend for the next 30 minutes your idea of what is crazy, what is normal, maybe we can meet eye to eye. Okay? And maybe you learn something from this. Because I feel like some of it we have put into practice. Just before this, I showed you all how the company is doing over the last quarter. It's all the results of this thinking and writing almost a year and a half ago. Usually in life, some of my success has been random luck or it's been failure. But this one was like very like written down, thought through, that played out almost exactly. And this is the, also the first time in my life where I sat down and thought about strategy because I always thought strategy is for losers. That's wrong. It's not for losers. But I wish I had that wisdom earlier. Anyway, next slide. This session is about bio, like how a company and biology are, uh, how our bodies work is kind of the same. It's not supposed to be 100% biologically accurate because I've taken some creative li liberties to give you an analogy. Uh, but it is close. And it's a good way to think about things. Next slide. Awesome. So we'll set some initial characters, okay? The CEO of a company, the person who founds it, the founder, let's say. Let's use the word founder. Do you think that's the brain of the company? Do you think a founder is the brain of the company? Some people said yes. Anyone disagree? Some people there disagree. I'll tell you what I think. I think the founder is more like the heart. Not for emotional reasons that he brought the company, he or she brought the company together. I don't, not because of those reasons. But I feel like a founder's job is to circulate resources inside the company. And I'm talking about when the company works, right? I'm not talking about day one, day two. But even on day one, day two, a founder's job is to circulate resources. It's a slightly different way to think about companies. So please bear with me. So if you can say that the founder is the heart, the founder's job is to send resources inside of this body that we'll call the company for now. So let's take two units. The blood, your bloodstream actually carries this. Let's call cash as oxygen. And let's call glucose as customer leads. These are two most important things you need to run a company. Believe it or not, the technology piece we'll come to in a bit, it actually enables both of this. Okay? So the heart beats, it sends blood to the rest of the body and it comes back. What is the brain? Who is the brain in all of this? It's the management team. It's your leadership team, your CXOs, your C-suite, VP level, whatever you want to call them, right? The folks there. That's the management team. The, those are the people that are making the actual day-to-day -day decisions. Not just for here, but in almost every other company because they have more context and we'll come to what that means in a bit. But let's start with these preconditions. With these preconditions, I think we'll be able to tell a good story that many of you will relate to. Next slide. So there's a disease called POTS. Has anyone heard of this? It stands for Postural Orthostatic Intolerance. No, Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. That's what it's called. So what happens is, in POTS, your heart sends blood to the rest of the body, but the blood starts pooling in your legs. Because the nerves in your legs, or, or rather the muscles in your legs, don't push blood back to the heart. You know what starts happening? Because the blood is not recirculating back to the heart, your heart starts pumping harder. Pa heart starts compensating. It's like, bro, you know, I need to push more blood because we're not hitting the... Your, your brain, you start feeling dizzy. So blood, your heart compensates. Your heart rate can go up to 100 plus. That's why it's called tachycardia. Right? Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Tachycardia stands for fast heart rate. Okay? So, if the founder is somebody who sends resources to the rest of the body, the founder has to compensate when the rest of the body does not return resources to him or her. Okay, next slide. So, 
the heart, which is the founder, if the company is not doing well, the founder has to send more and more resources. I'll tell you what it was like for me 10 years ago. Company was not doing well. I took, because I knew nobody at that time. Okay. You call customers. You open some book or some website. You call customers. You call investors. You're trying to get either cash or customer leads. So you call all these people and you're trying to get these leads and then divert it to your team. They go, your customer ayas, go, iske liye kuch karo. Right? So you're trying to do that. And if it's not working, then you beat harder. You're trying to send more of this. You're trying to absorb more of this. As a company, repeated cycles of expected stress and return, okay, which is you pump and it comes back, the cash flow, because the cash and oxygen, the oxygen, which is the cash and the customer leads has to return back to the founder. It has to keep coming back. Without that, it, you fail. So repeated cycles of expect, expected stress and return, which is exercise, we could also call it exercise. You run really hard. You're getting better at, you know, circulating nutrients. It makes the body better. Companies get better at converting more leads. Right now, we have a lot of leads. We need to convert them, right? Companies are actually inefficient at converting leads. So you get better at converting more leads and better at using less oxygen, right? When you run, if you keep running again and again, you can run that same 100 meter after a few months with much less oxygen consumption. So you burn less cash. You're a leaner company. You have to spend less talent to do the same work, right? Over time, the goal is for the heart to pump slower, actually. In the beginning, founders are always at a high heart rate trying to push, you know, stuff to the rest of the team. But athletes, well-oiled athletes, have a resting heart rate between 30 and 40 because the organs, everything, the body has become efficient. They're all very good at taking on lots of consumer lead, lots of customer leads at a very low uh, cash burn rate. Small teams, lean teams, you're able to do one person, two people, three people. The goal of the company is to run as is with minimal intention from the founders. We like to call this homeostasis. If you've ever studied biology in college, you know homeostasis is where the body maintains normal, you know, running sort of state. Um, and sort of like the heart has this economical zone where once you reach a particular heart rate, the circulation continues by itself. We call this momentum. When a company has momentum, it doesn't matter. Your founder could go sit in Hawaii for like two years, company will still do well. Momentum, getting into that momentum, getting to orbit, as some founders call this, product market fit is actually one of the hardest problems to solve in startups. It's not actually running the company that's that hard. It's not actually running the companies that that hard. It's actually getting to the place where company, running the company is on momentum that it's easier. Okay? Next slide. So, let's talk about communication next as we're talking about the body. So, there's also a biology lesson packed in this, which is, did you know the difference between an artery and a vein? You have both, arteries and veins. Arteries go away from the heart. Veins are towards the heart, right? So paths in companies are messy. Like I could go to Tejas, who is one of your bosses, and I could say, Tejas, can you get this person to do this? Or I could go to you directly. So it's messy how founders communicate with the teams, but it's also messy how teams communicate with their teams and how they access teams from you know, a different uh, vertical or whatever, right? It's complicated. So even if a path is blocked, the founder will usually find a teammate through another path. You've probably seen me do this multiple times. If I can't reach out to your boss, I'll just directly reach out to you and be like, hey, can you help me with this? And the last person I did this to was Natansh. Right? So directly reaching out to the person. Organs can also communicate with each other through chemicals sent through the bloodstream. Not everything needs to pass through the brain. Okay? Next slide. Let's talk about the nervous system. Did you know there are two nervous systems in your body? One is the central nervous system which is your brain and your spinal cord. Then there's the peripheral nervous system. Okay, these are things that come out of your spinal cord. These are things that are there, you know, when you touch something. Okay, so your human nervous system, the human version of this, the company version of this, has actually has two parts. One is high level management, also called the central nervous system. Okay, these are your CXOs, your vice presidents, whatever it's called. And your mid-level management, which is your peripheral nervous system. Okay, and you'll tu it turns out as companies mature over time, these are two different nervous systems, right? A Sachin and somebody sitting on top of Sachin are two very different entities, okay? The central nervous system makes conscious choices and sometimes unconscious ones, okay? So the central nervous system is deliberate about everything it does. The main focus is survival, just like any human, any organism. Survival, safety, reputation, reproduction, right? Our first goal as a company is to survive. Yeah? 
it's our main goal. Next thing is safety, that we're able to survive for a while. We have at least one year runway, two years runway, three years, and whatever it is. Then it's reputation. You want to be seen as a good company to work with. You want to be seen as a good company to work for. Reproduction, which is once something works, let's make the next thing work. Let's make the next thing work. To answer Shreya's question, it's this. Companies grow like crazy if, I mean, the goal is to also grow after you've figured out the other few things, right? Next slide, okay. Now let's talk about the peripheral nervous system. Very important we talk about the peripheral nervous system, mid-level management, because I think companies are run on mid-level management over time, okay? So I'll tell you how pain works. Okay, with you, let's take the finger as an example. Let's say I put the finger on something hot. There are actually two pains. One driven by the thinly myelinated um, uh, fibers and then the unmyelinated fibers. So it's actually two waves. One is the first pain and then there's a second pain. Did you know this? When you touch something hot, when you get hit, whatever it is, there are two pains. Okay, this is the peripheral nervous system in action. These are the nerves at the tips of everything. When mid-management senses something in the business, okay, you hear about the immediate problem first, there's a small delay, immediate first pain, and then you gain a deeper understanding of the problem a few weeks later, second pain. This sounds insane, but it's exactly how it works in companies as well. Would you agree to some extent? The point is that the central nervous system, is, which is the brain, the people making the executive decisions, are fully dependent on the peripheral nervous system for feedback. Like I actually don't know, like Sachin will know better than me about that specific thing if he's mid-level management than I do. I don't know enough, but Sachin comes back and says, this is working, this is not working. Trust me, right? So as long as our communication is efficient, he's touching the things on the outside, I'm making the decision on whether to pull the hand out or not. Okay, next slide. This opens up the company to all sorts of bullshittery and miscommunication between an external event taking place and top level management's understanding of it. Dude, the number of people who they'll see an external event happen to their company or some event happen to the company and walk away with the wrong impression, walk away with the, walk away with the wrong idea. Oh, we, we pushed this feature, that's why the app did well. But actually what it could be is, maybe it was Diwali and people really wanted your app and you were selling something on your app that's responsible, I mean that was tied into Diwali. Like getting accurate attribution of why something worked is so hard because everyone, all over the place in your company is trying to take credit for it. So there's like an insane amount of bullshittery going on of which, what actually worked, what didn't work, etc. right? Strategy is set by executives, but the actual execution and feedback collection is performed by mid-level management and maybe the lower level folks, right? People who are actually sitting on the thing day to day. If your nervous, if your peripheral nervous system is not built to be fast and accurate, which is mid-level management, touch something, decide this is not the right thing to do or this is the right thing to do, your exec team will face all sorts of problems the decision makers, right? So early stage companies should probably not have a peripheral nervous system. Your central nervous system, peripheral nervous system are very muddled. Some of mid-level management can be seen as high level, high levels also doing mid-level. Your central nervous system must directly be in contact with the world. You can't sit on a high horse and say, yeah, we should try this and then not actually see what the results of that are. In Paul Graham's words, talk to users in the early days, right? But you should be doing that. And when you have mid-level management, your mid-level management should be doing that. The brain on the other hand, your central nervous system, is also sense-making. It navigates, it tells itself a story, okay? A lot of people think it's the CEO or the founder's job to tell the story internally, but I don't think that's true. Today, it doesn't matter. I mean, I can influence it to some extent, but I feel like after a while, the top and mid-level management will create their own culture and internal story. Do you know, <coughs> there are four companies here. You all work out of the same office, but all your company stories are so different from each other, right? Your goals, your ideas, what you want to do next, what the company is doing, the team, everything is so different across the four of you. Your objectives. So it's very incredible how, uh, you know, you all created your own culture, you all have created your own internal story, and it's kind of out of my control. You might think, but Varun, it's in your control. You can go, you can, you can say this. It's not, right? And maybe I, in the early days, it was a lot in my control. Now it's like, it really depends on, you know, outputs. If the company fails or the company stops performing, then the narrative will change by itself whether I say or do not say anything. Okay, next slide. Middle level management, including HR, sales management, finance, they're all organs. Till now we've spoken about the brain, we've spoken about the heart. Some are external facing like the ears. They're picking up information from outside. Some are internal like the liver. The liver produces glucose, right? It's the sales department in a company. When your blood sugar dips, like during fasting or intense exercise, when you need more 
you know, cash, or when you need more customer leads in this case. The liver can make glucose from scratch, from the resources that it has. So you can think of this process like outbound sales. Sales can generate money, right? The liver also stores glucose in the form of glycogen in a process called glyconeogenesis, right? Um, sorry, it's glycogenolysis. Basically, the liver can also store glucose, which is leads for later extraction. Remember, glucose equal to leads. Today, Shashank Elamanchi came with, with this thing about a company, let's just say it's a very big real estate company. He's like, hey, they really like what we sent, but I don't think they're proceeding with us right now. But it's good to build a relationship with them because we all understand now that three months later, six months later, nine months later, they'll do something with us. So there's no rush. We can extract something out of them later as long as we build a good relationship and, you know, Necessarily, in the short term, we, we shouldn't be looking for a, you know, a sweet run. We can store that relationship for later. You want the brain's control on things like the liver to be automatic. And this is important, okay? You want leadership, let's say a Tejas here, to have like sales or sending out decks, this, that. Tejas shouldn't be involved in it at all. It needs to be automatic. What that means is that you want sales to be a process. If people leave or new people join, you want everything from onboarding to appraisals to exit to be sort of automatic. Your sales team, it's a weird way to think about it. Your sales team, if one person is leaving, you need to be able to replace them ASAP, which means you need to have all the processes, all the documentation, all the KT possible. You also need this with engineers. You also need this with editors. It's more like an automatic process, right? Still very, very important, but still to some extent automatic. Whereas, next slide, whereas, some parts you want the brain's control over to be partially automatic, like the eyes or mouth, right? What this means is that some parts of the business are full of ambiguity and require really smart analytical people to make decisions and lose their jobs if they make the wrong decisions, right? All your leadership here will lose their job if they make the wrong decisions two in a row, right? Whereas it's less important for like somebody who just joined or somebody who's a fresher to make very, very important decisions multiple times in a row. It's more forgiving. Okay, so the eyes are like the system that looks at the outside world, markets, competitors, etc. It's an organ, right? The brain needs manual control over this to a large extent, and you want to avoid this being fully automatic. If your research guy leaves, it's not like you have some automated process where you get the next person because you need the, the research by, guys. The, the research person is very, very important, right? And makes and not just research. The person making decisions on the research very, very important. Can't it's not an automatic process that you can create. Making decisions on which markets to enter probably shouldn't be an automatic formula -like process, right? Obviously. Hiring for automatic versus non-automatic roles is also very different, okay? For automatic roles, you are probably looking for diligence and the ability to do the same thing over and over again well. You're looking for all the things that, you know, are required, plus you're looking for somebody who can do the same thing again and again. For non-automatic roles, you're probably looking for a lot more creativity and initiative, but also experience. You actually don't want too much initiative in an automatic sales process, for example. You want people who can follow the process well. Whereas, in your, the, let's say the uh, process of research or creativity, you actually don't want people who can follow the process well, and actually they would suffer if you make them do the process well. But at the same time, you can't expect reliability. There are pros and cons on either side. So your analyst will sometimes be wrong, very often will be wrong. And if they're wrong too often, then you know it's not good for the company. Same time, somebody storyboarding a video, a creative person. You cannot say you have to storyboard a video every three days. Have you seen how Ocus will suffer if you make him do that? Or anyone creative here to do storyboarding every X number of days? No, they need their own cadence, they need their own time. Some videos will take three weeks, some videos will take three days. You've seen this happen. It's not possible to predict this. You can have a rough idea, but you cannot predict this. So very different expectations from both roles. And we knew going in that there'll be parts of the business that are automatic, parts of the business that are creative slash ambiguous. How do we, how do we, what's the kind of talent we need from both ends? So how do we create our hiring structure? Next slide. Most organs failing will kill your company, but some you can survive without. You can run a company without certain organs, okay? For example, HR is like kidneys. It filters blood. So communication, leads, cash, it filters all of it. But it's not perfect. Sometimes bad stuff will get through. And if your kidneys are damaged, then all bad stuff will get through. So, like if companies that go really bad, go bad because of HR, in my opinion. Because the HR sets a set of expectations, the HR is diluting communications from the founders or the management to people. It's not, like I don't like HR run companies. My personal opinion, I'm sure some people are out there doing HR run companies really well, but I feel it's like you're just pushing the problem to somebody else, right? You can cut off a large part of your kidneys and you'll be fine. The lungs are like the finance department. They circulate filtered oxygen in the bloodstream, which is cash, as we've spoken about. You can live, 
with one lung or kidney, you can run with poor HR, you can run with poor finance, but you'll pay the price later for cutting off these parts. Some like design, hair, they make you more attractive, but, um, but the human body is okay without it too. Do you know one thing? We could still run without design. We would not be doing as well as we're doing or how the last quarter is done. I don't think we could have done that without high quality design, cross video and whatnot, I get that. But we could also run without it. We'll make far less money, but we wouldn't die. Right, so it's a nice to have, and you need the nice to haves also as you'll as we'll come to. Okay. Next slide. The job of most of the organs is to maintain homeostasis. Okay, homeostasis the body's absorb. This is a chat GPT definition. Is the body's ability to maintain relatively stable internal environment despite changes in the external environment. So market keeps changing, stuff keeps happening in the market. Today this guy does this, today that guy does that. Outside you have to react to it. This means keeping things like body temperature, blood sugar levels, pH balance, fluid levels within a narrow healthy range. Their job is to keep things running as is, okay? As an enlightened lumberjack would say, chop wood, carry water. <laughs> okay, next slide. Okay, at some scale, you will start having a research division, okay? It try, which tries new things. The research department and new projects are similar to the hands and legs of the body. So hands and legs helped early man explore new environments, markets, and make tools, build efficiencies. Today, without our R&D department, which currently is kind of mixed with Varun Maya team, is uh, you know the flux lora stuff. Thumbnails we've, we've automated to some extent, right? The, the um, AI avatars, the AI audio, it wouldn't be possible if there's some bunch of people that are just trying new stuff. So it comes from there. Next slide. So that was the baseline. I set the baseline of how a company is an organism. Now let's look at how that organism works in different markets, okay? First, let's talk about how organisms live. How do they live? If oxygen, which is cash, and glucose, which is customer leads, are important, how does human beings, how do we manufacture food? How do we get glucose? From the environment? We eat food? So let's talk about food first, okay? To produce glucose, humans eat food. Okay, so those customer leads that are coming in are not gonna come from inside, you're not gonna be able to produce them, they need to come from outside, correct? In our case, Food is our distribution, okay? The, and I wrote this a long time ago, the people that watch our videos. For other companies, it may be the advertisements they're running or the people they know in their contacts list who may buy whatever they are selling, right? It's people you know, it's customer leads from outside that you can bring into the business. And this is not for all businesses, specific to the kind of businesses we run, but it can be generalized to all businesses. Some distribution is like protein, some is like carbohydrates, okay? Ignore the health influences, both carbohydrates and protein are important. Humans can't live with just protein. If you ate just protein, you would have problems after a few weeks. You also need some carbs, right? And actually, while some people will say all the benefits of a keto diet, you actually need a diverse carbohydrate diet as well. It's a healthy way to live. So, carbohydrates are the kind of audiences you gain from putting out short form, low loyalty, low insight content. Short form, all short form content we produce in the company right now, in my books, is the equivalent of carbohydrate. Okay? Protein is the kind of audience you gain from putting out deep, meaningful, well-researched, insightful content. Long form content. So yesterday, uh, AV's video did, well, it'll do a million views, something like that, right? Uh, I also put out a couple of videos which got some views, but I know that short form, even though we maybe did a million views yesterday on short form on my channel, I'm very confident the loyalty on AV will be much higher on that video. Because it's long form, it's deep, insightful. And you can see, right, like, people are sharing that. So, you can compare the relative loyalty of a short and long form creator and see that long form creators command far more loyalty than new age short form creators. The more educational the content, the more loyalty. Okay, so Physics Wala is a good example of this. Short form content is far easier to produce than long form content. Carbs are easier to eat than protein, obviously. Very easy to digest, tasty. What you want though is to create content that looks like carbohydrate, but packs protein inside, okay? The health wave in America is perfect of this. You go to any store in America, you'll see these beautifully packaged things, which are like protein and very boring to eat, I'm sure, but packaged very well. So your thumbnail title still needs to be, you know, like pictured like carbohydrates, like something sleazy, but the actual content has to be good. This is the content I aspire, personally aspire to make, right? Solid, meaningful, insightful content, but packaged like candy. And just so you know, it's all written like 
quite some time ago. And I'm glad, and at that time our numbers were nowhere close to what our numbers are today. So you have to see the, you have to appreciate the fact that we understood this space pretty well before we even got in because I was like, such a risky thing, no, to do content as a business. Next slide. Yeah, these are the American, these are all healthy. Plant-based, protein, three egg whites, 14 peanuts, two dates. See how well they've packaged it. It's beautiful. And this is what we should aspire to do. Create deep, meaningful, insightful content and then back that up or package it in this. And these guys have perfected it. You can see it. It's deep, meaningful, insightful content. How does a 10 rupee Indian, 100 rupee Indian, 1000 rupee Indian live and package just so well. Next slide. There's a version of carbohydrate you should avoid consuming though. Ultra processed carbs. Okay, this, this is the online version of clickbait content filled with very little substance, typically attacking some individual online. This brings you an audience that generally doesn't convert into leads because people don't take you seriously. Like this was happening with Warp recently. If you see on Twitter, right? It's just garbage. Like there's no point of doing that content because it will not, it will push people away from you. Okay. The Holy Grail is a high calorie protein meal disguised as a carbohydrate. The channel Kurjus are, I don't know how to pronounce them. Kurz Kazat. Kurz Kazat. <laughs> Whatever. Great channel. Kurz Kazat. Kurz Kazat. Yes. Um, is a great example of this. High quality science content wrapped in childlike packaging, pretty, pretty visuals. Uh, I remember watching them many, many years ago. Every time they put out a video on black holes or anything, right, I will go watch it. And remember, I can't even pronounce the name of the channel well, but I still have such brand loyalty. Their identity is unique. You seen their identity? That those birds, the calendars that they make, unique identity. They packaged it beautifully well, very memorable over the long term. Whereas they did just, just did science content. One guy standing there saying, oh, this is what happens in a black hole. Nobody cares. No brand value, no recognition two, three years later. So this matters. However, what we've realized is people don't like investing in protein. Long form is expensive, deeply researched content is boring to produce after a while because you actually have to sit and do the research. Uh, carbs, pizza, way more fun to produce, easier to produce in a factory-like fashion, but protein brings you solid long-term glucose. We're going back to the glucose piece now. You need customer leads. Have you seen what happens? With, have you ever seen a blood glucose graph when you eat protein or carbs? Carbs will go like this and drop. But protein is flat. What you want is flat. There are videos I've done three years ago that still get me leads, you know? The Indus Valley reports that I do still get me leads. People saying, hey, we should do this together, we should do that together. So creating the protein of content is what we should really be aiming for while we still do some of the carbs. Carbs are useful if you need a quick fix of leads. Tomorrow, this week, if we need some leads for something, we will figure out a way to make a short form video that works, either an ad or not. Okay, this is why companies that fully rely on advertising need to keep doing it every day or die. My personal opinion is not a great way to run a business, right? To be fully dependent on ads. There are companies you can run purely on brand and organic distribution. Maybe a little bit of advertising is fine, but these companies, the companies that run purely on brand and organic distribution, I had this, I did this one podcast with Nitin Kamath. And Nitin said at the ending that their margin is exactly what their cost of acquisition would have been like if they had a cost of acquisition on ads. It's exactly the same. They're like, we would have made zero profit if we were spending on advertising. So in 12 years, we had gotten to, I think, accrue customers. If I had spent, we had spent three to 4,000 rupees a customer to acquire, there would have been around 4,000 crores. That was all the profits we had made in two, 12 years, right? So 11, 12 years. So that means if we had spent three to 4,000 rupees a customer, we you would not, not be, be profitable. Wow. You know, so it's, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if people are- Wow, so your CAC is your margin. It's a different way of looking at it, but, uh, but yeah, it is, it is that. <laughs> Interesting. You can run businesses without advertising. It's not, it's not as wild as you think it is. And all the best companies in the world have been run like that. Next slide. The reason I believe distribution based businesses are going to be extremely disrupted. And this, remember, this was written a while ago, right? Before we had any of the things that were going on for us right now is because other types of businesses that have existed so far cannot grow their own crops. Okay. Distribution based businesses are like the agricultural revolution. The other companies are either hunting, which is they're doing outbound sales, they're sending email to somebody else saying, please use my product or service or whatever. Or they're buying food at the table at the Facebook restaurant or Google Ads cafe. Think about it, no, you want customer leads, you want glucose, okay? How are you gonna get that food to get that glucose? You're either going to go to somebody else to a restaurant and say, give me food, or you're going to hunt for the food yourself, okay? For the great revolution, equivalent to 
when man moved on from hunting and gathering to agriculture, the agricultural revolution where we realized we can just grow crops ourselves. And that is what we wanted to be when we started this company. We started AOS. Like, can we build our own distribution? Can we grow our own crops ourselves? So we do not need to depend on advertising or maybe minimally dependent on advertising. We do not need to go do outbound sales and hunt for leads ourselves. Even though now we do a little bit of both. This happens to other businesses as well. After getting fed up with the ad platforms, they come to us as creators, influencers, whatever you want to call it. Because they also realize they can come to our farms for food at better rates. At the end of the day, in a way, let's take one of our channels, let's take my channel. You know I'm slightly competitive with Meta or Google to some extent. Uh, obviously they're much, much, much bigger, but the competition is when an advertiser comes, they have to choose between spend one rupee on ads directly on, on Meta, let's say uh, Instagram, or spend one rupee on Varun. They have this choice. And actually uh, the prices for what we charge are just slightly under what it would cost for ad prices on that, on the range they want. On the, expected views that they want. So we are competitive with them in pricing. And it's a very important distinction because if you look at YouTube, they've started this new brand thing where you can, brands can reach out to creators on YouTube itself and do deals with them directly on YouTube itself. So they are also trying to find a way where they can use our farms to kind of sell that as end food to a brand or a business. But my personal opinion, and the reason we built, uh, as part of AOS, something called YouTube as a service, which is YAS, is that we can introduce companies to the agricultural revolution. Why we defend, in a, in a way, YAS is competitive with what I do. I built a, one of the businesses we built, a brand as a choice, either go to Varun and do get some content out on his platform or some, any other creator, or I can go to YAS and build my own content so long term I'm safe and secure, right? So it's all, you have to understand, these are all slightly competitive, but it's the right thing for the business to do over the long run, to build their own content, to build their own distribution, right? So we set up farms for them. We introduce them to the agricultural revolution, and that is the only reason YAS works, because brands are getting fed up with ads, right? Both running ads, as well as being dependent on ads. They're like, let's go organic. Okay, next slide. Next, let's talk about markets. We understood now we need customer leads from outside. Any business you run, you need customers. Whether B2B, B2C, you need customers. So where do you find these customers? You find customers in places called markets. Okay, next slide. Let's go back to the eyes for a second. Eyes are an organ. A lot of people think that the brain and the eye are separate. They're not really separate. Um, if you look at an embryo, you'll see that there's a very strong relationship with brain and eyes. Uh, especially in like, if you look at, even if you look at like earlier mammals, it's the same across them as well. You cannot make executive decisions without keeping your eyes peeled. You should know miles in advance if oxygen or food are disappearing in your territory. I take a good example of this, right? They had time to see that online was not working as well and they needed to move offline, okay? Some of them made that move, some of them did not. But if your eyes are not peeled and you cannot predict the next two, three years, I don't think it's gonna work. So. This means that by looking at how the market needs are evolving and whether customers exist or are being taken away by some other competitor or are changing their behavior, because that can happen as well, right? You can change your behavior over time. With AI, all of this is more important than ever because with AI, it turns out customers are changing their behavior. Like, like I said, right, one thing I'm very sure about is over, in the long run, people will prefer to watch more AI-generated content than real content. Nobody watching this video believes me. But I have evidence on the contrary. And that doesn't mean you create crap AI content, right? You create something with a story, it works. So you need to keep your eyes peeled and you need to run that experiments by yourself. Okay, now let's talk about other organizations. In this context, they would be akin to other bodies or humans or whatever, right? Other companies are just like you. They have their own circulatory system, they have their own management, they have their own needs, etc., etc. Some are peers, you get to learn from them. Next slide. But mainly I want to talk about threats, okay? A small proportion of them will be buying for the same food sources you are going after in the same piece of land as you. Market came out, you have competitors. Usually you shouldn't see things as threats. Any new company that competes with you, usually they don't last too long or you know they might be going after a different track, whatever. But the minute they compete with you and seem competent, okay, usually it's the colorful ones, the ones with distribution you can tell, right? They are the colorful ones, they're the ones that are very loud. Uh, you generally have to take notice. 
Step one is identifying the threat. Okay. Ideally, it's the eyes and brains that identify these threats early. Step two is to decide whether you want to fight or run. Okay. It's a very, very important decision. What does run mean? In a business, what does running away mean? Choosing a different market. What does fighting mean? How do you fight an enemy in the market? Fighting is a weird thing, right? It happens in the real world with fists and all that. How does it happen in the market? Market check? No, I'll tell you how fighting happens in the market. You outspend the enemy. More projects, more, so, more features, more ad spend, more customers, etc. Whichever path you choose, the standard sympathetic fight response takes place. You know the sympathetic response is? Right? Fight or flight. You know that feeling? You start sweating, you're attentive, your eyes start getting tunnel vision, you feel anxiety. The founder will start pumping more cash, oxygen, and leads glucose. I remember the one time, not giving, I'm going to give you specifics, where there was a competitor in one of our spaces, and we just started spending on ads. This is true. Some of you know when we did this. It was the first time we ever ran an ad because we're like, oh, competitors now come in one of our spaces. We got scared. We start pumping more resources, wasting more money. But it's inevitable. You have to do it, right? So I will, be st I will start sending you more customer leads. I'll be like, we have to beat them. I, I will start sending you uh, redirecting cash to you. Or whoever the you know, management team is, they'll start redirecting cash. Right? So the glucose level of the body actually go up during a stressful event. So your spends go higher. Right? You're now under stress. You're now competing. It's called the counter-regulatory response. Breathing now gets faster. So your cash consumption is higher. Have you run? You've seen a breathing rate go up when you run? So all that starts happening. Now you either run, which is you pivot, and you're entering a new market, so you have to figure all of it out, so you need to run very, very fast, because it's a new market. Or fight. Okay? Most founders will spend a lot more on advertising, generating leads, when a competitor is hot on their heels. I've seen this play out too many times. Too many times I've seen competitors, like a founder, say, okay, now I'm going to start spending more because now I have competitors. Next thing. That's why Peter Thiel keeps saying, right? Competition's for losers. It makes you run a stressed body all the time. The more you are well-oiled, the more exercise you have performed, the lower your oxygen consumption, and the higher your ability for you to sink glucose into your muscles, the better. So if you're in great shape, you can either pivot quickly, go enter a new market, win that market quickly, or beat the other person. But I'm of the philosophy that you should avoid, this is me personally, that you should avoid too many direct fights unless you are going to be a clear winner. Unless you know, bro, I can easily beat this new person that's come in, you should not be taking the fight. If it's too big a player, unless you won the market, if you are still figuring out or you don't have clear PMF, better pivot. Okay? Because no matter what, in any fight, you will take damage. In any fight with any other competitor, we will have to spend. Okay? You will spend more. You may lose customers. Your ability to explore and do research is limited. The competitor will start doing f funny shit with your customers. Adrenaline gives you tunnel vision, so it narrows your eyes. You can't do R&D. Um, your focus is also very, very narrowed. Like, maybe one of the reasons why we've expanded so much and we have now four verticals that are doing well is because we've had the liberty of not having too much competition in our spaces. We've gone after certain markets that I don't think are venture attractive markets. So it allows us to sort of focus on multiple things. But if, let's say, there was one of the businesses under threat, we felt that, then it would be narrow tunnel vision on that business for a while. Right? So any company with a threat to their core business goes back into tunnel vision. Who's the last company that did this? Big company that did this. When they were, their main thing was a threat, they shut down, or not shut down, they stopped focusing on everything else, went after the main thing. You want to know? It's called Google. When OpenAI came out, ChatGPT, Google sounded a code red, right? Yeah. It's this. It's back to tunnel vision. You can relax and spread out only when you have some monopoly type dynamics. Otherwise, you can't. If animals take damage in a fight, what are the alternatives? I told you, fighting is bad. OK? They turn to display. So what animals do in a battle is they start posturing. You've seen this, right? Show yourself as bigger. Show your, put, your, put your hood out if you're a snake. So you're demanding the other person to back down. You're saying, you go choose another market. This is my territory. right? It's actually a physical damage sparing move. Companies beef up. They raise money for a war chest. They do PR. It's the best company. They do the song and dance on Twitter. You know, you know what I'm talking about, right? They raise like an insane amount of money. But regardless, if you have to fight, prepare to take damage. And also, better be in good shape. If you're a company that's unnecessarily leaking cash, 
you're not in good shape. You have to be able to run lean because in a fight, this matters, right? So uh, if you already absorb a lot of glucose or have a high oxygen requirement in a race or too much fat tissue, uh, you should avoid fighting actually. Almost every time there is fertile land discovered with juicy fruit in it, expect a fight. Any new market, expect a fight. Next slide. The other alternative is to settle for partnering with them and being number two. Don't fight. Get acquired. Acquisitions are a good route to this. Eventually, markets consolidate because a few decide to band up and co compete out the others, which is actually a very viable strategy. Monkeys do this a lot. Weaker monkeys will partner against an alpha in order to take on the alpha. Because in animals, usually, like lower level animals, usually one on one, but humans and monkeys, you can band up, you can group up. If we feel like we are going to lose a type of content space, we try to partner with other top content creators. We have done this before. When you partner, you lose significant equity in that channel, but you gain more certainty. You're like, okay, one plus one here can win out the market and being number one actually matters. It gets you a lot of deal flow. Uh, to defend from large sectors, especially if the market's really, really big, you, can, you lose, um, you need allies. We have a lot of companies who today we think are allies, right? Treat them nicely, share as much as you can, send them deals, send them as much work, help them. Investors, partners, friends, they'll be useful when a bigger sectoral threat comes over. You'll see this a lot in finance, right? Where Every time one new rule comes, all the finance founders will stick in solidarity, even though in a way they compete with each other. Because they realize the bigger daddy is you know, out there. Okay, if people think you are sitting on fertile land, they'll come disturb you, right? So people can partner and come after you. Make sure you have allies or you may lose ground. Like I said, easiest way is to avoid spaces with too much competition. The ways to do this are to pick a small niche with an unattractive, minimally fertile land with very few growing fruits. If I say I'm going after a market where there are only like very less revenue, no VC funded competitor will compete. Nobody will compete. They'll be like, it's boring, it's too small. Okay. The alternative, which I prefer, is to find an early market with land that you believe will become fertile in a few seasons. Like this content space, especially the way we are approaching content, right? In a more B2B fashion, in a more with artificial intelligence fashion, I think is a very, very fertile space, but it's underrated. People don't believe it. People don't believe that AI generated content can be watchable or viewable or whatever, right? I think they're wrong. And because they don't believe it's true, they're going after everything else in AI. Oh, we'll build the next LLM because, again, that's a very competitive space. And winning is really hard. The giants there are really big giants. So we choose a very different route, right? So they will figure it out someday that there's a fertile land there, but you need time to eat, absorb the leads, absorb the customer leads, absorb the oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. By which time when they come, you're big enough to take that battle if necessary. If there's a new green pasture, you should beware. Uh, like if everyone knows there's a new market there, it's very scary because otherwise you'll be number 10 and you'll get very little. All your competitors with much larger watches will actually bully you. They see the opportunity too. Remember, if you see all of this, this sounds like me admitting to the fact that I can't compete with venture funded companies directly. Therefore, I need to pick markets that I know they won't get into. But it turns out, and what I was unsure about that back then when I wrote this and what I'm sure about now, is that actually if you choose some of these niches and you actually get some progress, then you can get big enough where tomorrow if a venture funded company comes in, it's very, dude, like I said, we do like more than 150 million views a month now in English content, right? You can't buy that. Like you can't, you may be able to buy it in ads, but you can't remake that with capital. It's very hard to build a new media network. And I see some of the money that other media companies, new media companies are trying to do to, are trying to spend to make a new media network. And I'm like, that's unsustainable. And I'm glad we took over this space quickly. Uh, at least for the kind of content we wanted to create. There's still a lot of niches which we haven't tapped or we haven't managed to tap, but that's for a different day. Next slide. But the core problem, back again, is that in any battle, you're taking stress. When you're stressed, your body temperature goes up, breathing rate goes up, you're using up more cash, spending more to generate leads. As a founder, you're prioritizing away from you know anything other than winning that land battle. You'll flood the system with adrenaline and cortisol. Like I said before, adrenaline gives you tunnel vision. Uh, it increases glucose levels. Paradoxically, if glucose and oxygen levels fall too low, like we're running out of cash or leads, your body actually responds with adrenaline again to raise glucose levels. This is the counter-regulatory response actually. So unnecessarily, organs are temporarily slowed. Like uh, your stomach is not very important in a fight. So digestion slows down, right? Um, brain experiences anxiety. So when you're un under stress as a business fighting somebody else, you do more, your leadership makes the most irrational decisions. Oh, that guy's doing this, oh, I'll do this. It's all this, right? So it's not 
well thought out decisions next slide okay unless you see a gap you should not take on any new ecosystem um existing if someone's already won a market they already have the relationships uh they, with customers they already have iterated on product long enough they have glucose and oxygen reserves they have a war chest they know obvious pitfalls they know the map well part of becoming successful as a company seems to be making your own knowledge of your own terrain complete to understand your space really well uh you can choose to make it intentionally confusing for competitors as well right uh i was saying this about build in public right one learning i had with build in public is if you're not doing well nobody cares or they're laughing at you if you're doing well you're leaking secrets so build in public is not a good strategy sell in public is fine but build in public is actually not very good strategy ki mai itna mrr bana raha hu ye wo you know i i know founders were literally sitting on twitter looking for the next guy revealing mrr if the number is good they will clone the business so like then why are you revealing the numbers status no you're doing it for status to show that you're big don't do it because you're putting a, you're telegraphing a map of your ecosystem i know a lot of companies in india who are like oh we're so profitable we're doing so well are you surprised then when there are now vc funded competitors outspending you don't be surprised um i'm in a lot of founders who are making several times more than unicorns but uninterested in the press because they want to hide their competitive advantage from others also i feel like looking at a media article of a company and making a decision is like making a map of a place while drunk right because it's like no company doing well will reveal enough secrets and any external research it's not ever going to know what's exactly happening in a company it's very scary to make those decisions based on third hand information fourth hand information um and beware of hungry competitors about to die they do all sorts of random shit uh very young companies with nothing to lose they will try in every route to pick a battle against you or use your name everywhere uh very ambitious people uh i think there are some founders who are very very ambitious outside who are never happy with anything very very hungry uh i fear them there's nothing wrong with saying this right i fear those founders because uh only the paranoid survive and every time i meet some of those founders i keep track and i know all the founders in india who see another founder doing good stuff in any space they will track them because they'll be like ye kya kar raha hai i want to know before anybody else in the animal kingdom this colorful competitors of distribution in animal kingdom this is known as aposematism this you know red back this that stay away from me i think with distribution you have some of that where competitors are a little worried about entering your space because like these guys already have so much distribution like competing against a facebook people still try <coughs> but i think when you have distribution it's or aggressive behavior it's not wise to battle them next slide next let's talk about the vc funded company so the vc funded company is very strange because um, next slide he's going to win some fights right this is a person that's intentionally increased their breathing rate to like maximum intentionally increased their you know glucose rate to maximum uh has you know he's a bully he's basically been taking steroids outside glucose he's been fed right outside uh, oxygen he can outcompete other players in the short term and in fertile lands where the winner takes everything a competitor who has raised a lot can be a serious threat but he will get diabetes do you know why as a company when you build a company on the philosophy that i'm going to spend insane amounts of money okay to keep this alive or to even get started it's very hard to cut off that fat your glucose requirement is always high your oxygen requirement is always high when your glucose requirement is always very very high your baseline glucose high you have diabetes so it's not in the short term yes you can bully and win a land and the way the googles of the world have actually won being vc funded companies is the incredible burn rate doesn't matter when you're a company that wins a very very fertile land like the entire internet google it back then right then actually it doesn't matter you can have as much waste as you want you can have a very very high burn rate and it doesn't matter you've seen with us as well right like now that we're trying to do slightly well we can afford to let go of a smaller office and say let's get a bigger one even if there's some lease time left on the old office it's okay to be slightly wasteful if you know things are generally trending upwards and sometimes there are markets so big that if you totally dominate them uh it doesn't matter whether you've taken vc funding it's a small blip in the you know in the radar but for me personally no matter how well we do we avoid overspending on anything okay that's why i chose to do bootstrap this time because i'm like the minute i raise vc by itself your baseline everything is increased so pivoting changing markets especially in ai where we're unclear about anything it's very very hard to make those decisions up front because as much as we wrote all of this a long time ago and some of it turned out to be right could have been wrong also no 
So you have to model that risk. It's a wiser option long term and it also gives you us plenty of time to exercise. I said if we go in a new small field, bootstrap it, we'll get to learn, we'll get to gain some experience over the next one, one and a half years. Um, but in order to bootstrap, like I said, I need to look for less fertile, unattractive land, less likely to attract VC steroid monsters. Um, or to be early to a fertile land that VCs do not believe yet is fertile. All VCs thought the LLM route is a much more fertile route, right? Like build our own LLM or whatever. I don't know what they were thinking honestly, but we knew that early on because if you actually experiment with all this, you go keep checking different markets, you'll get an idea of what's working, what's not working. And you cannot do it without experiment, without trying one or two experiments. Next slide. A healthy body. Next slide. Now we've spoken about the body, we've spoken about you know, food, proteins, and carbohydrates. We've talked about markets and fertile land where you can get this protein and carbohydrate. But let's talk now about internally in the body. When you're a young company with five to 10 employees, the surface areas of your arteries are small. They're clear. Over time, cholesterol deposits plaque, creates blockages. You get stiff. Changing things require a lot of approvals now. Do you know, when we were a young company, changing the internet, very easy process. Today, it's actually a hard process. Like who runs it? Who's going to get approvals? Who's approving budgets? It's all a headache now. So you start getting stiff. Bureaucracy appears. Ego, there's a lot of ego in between that starts slowing down the company. Founders need to be capable of pumping through the plaque if they need to, right? I won't tolerate, like, I was here Sunday uh, because we needed to get something shipped today. And I was here Sunday and I was like, if I don't sit here, it's not going to get done. So I had to come on Sunday, right? Which I don't care about. Because I'm like, this is the one blockage and I need to cut through the blockage. You need to keep seeing threats or exercising to avoid plaque. Why does, why does cholesterol form plaques if you just sit in one place and do nothing? If you're constantly exercising, if you're constantly under stress return, stress return, you get good at you know, avoiding this plaque. Nothing like competitors keep you, just, as much as we said that competition is bad, nothing like competitors to keep you focused on the battle instead of internal bullshit. You want lean, mean and flexible arteries. You might think, well, why don't you saying that if we make a lot of money and we do well, we're going to become a lazy company? The answer is yes. I've seen this happen to so many companies where if they faced a really strong competitor, they would struggle a little bit, okay? Once plaque has developed, removing it is always, will always hurt surrounding tissue, but it needs to be removed at some point, right? So communication blockages happen very often in companies, especially like these kind of companies, and it's our job to identify where the communication blockage is, or somebody doing politics or drama, and, and, and identify the problem and say, this is a problem, we need to solve it. I'm sure all of you at some point, now that we've grown a little rapidly, you have experienced this in the company? Some amount of ego, communication blockages, drama. You've seen this? We need to cut that out quickly. The best, best equivalent for arteries in a company are your communication channels. Slack, WhatsApp, you know, or in-person communication. You want fairly transparent communication between everyone, except to and from the brain where you have a blood-brain barrier. Do you know we have a blood-brain barrier? It prevents molecules above a certain size from entering the brain. Okay, it keeps toxins out in some way. Many medications don't cross the blood-brain barrier. The BB protects the brain from pathogens and toxins, toxins circulating in the blood, which could disrupt you know, your brain's function, your leadership's function. You have to have some privileged information at the level of your executive management. Allowing nonsense into the blood-brain barrier creates chaos. As much as people have appreciated remote work, my opinion on remote work is it slows down your communication system. Remember that thing I told you about the mid-level management and senior management? If your mid-level management is remote and they're touching something, re recognizing it, they're going to slowly transmit that information to upper-level management. So you're not going to be able to tell very quickly what's happening in the company the minute you start working remote, especially with a large company size. Right? That's why all of them said during pandemic, all the big companies said, oh, we'll do remote. Now they're all like, come back to office, otherwise lose your job. Why? Because they're suffering from communication lapses. The feedback loop from your peripheral nervous system finding out something new to your environment, about your environment to brain making a decision, that gap is very important. Uh, this is okay. I mean, it's okay to be slightly slow if you're already in the chop wood carry water. If there's no competition, you think the coast is clear, you can continue doing the same thing remote, but very hard when you have to pivot or fight or flight. Next slide. I think this is the last chapter. Let's talk about autoimmunity. Next slide. I'm not sure who said this, but um, there's this quote. 100% of early battles are external, but as the company matures, 50% of battles are internal. In the beginning, it was all external battles. Now, there's some internal bullshit, right, that we need to keep solving. That's because of autoimmunity. When employees are disconnected from revenue, like editors or engineers, where you don't know exactly whatever you're doing, how much revenue it's adding or deleting, um, you don't have to directly uh, focus on threats. 
some start creating internal fires because they're not directly connected to revenue. They're not feeling the stress that a salesperson is feeling. And I think some of that is important. I don't know how you create, it's not about creating the stress. I don't know how you communicate the stress that the salesperson is feeling to somebody who's not in sales. Um, I'll tell you a better way to think about it. It's useful to think about the human immune system actually has two parts. One is the adaptive immune system and one is the innate immune system. Let me explain both, okay? This is an actual thing. The innate immune system is your body's first line of defense. Non-specific system, anything it looks at that's roughly looks like a threat, responds quickly. When non-specific problems occur, companies already have some idea of how to fix them. Your bathroom shop's working, we all know roughly how we'll fix it, right? Um, the adaptive immune system, which is also known as the acquired immune system, which is what we take vaccines for, right? Is a branch that develops a highly specific response to individual pathogens. To very specific pathogens like, no, this one we have to mount, COVID we have to mount a response. And we have to mount it quickly. The hallmark is the antibody response. You'll have an, you can take a blood test and you'll actually get an antibody level against that particular pathogen, right? Um, most employees, actually, you all will create an antibody response depending on how the founders react to something. Non-specific in, innate immune system you all have. Somebody's being extremely toxic, you'll all be like, bro, he's being extremely toxic. But some things, like for example, um, let's say I reacted very poorly to running ads. Whatever, I'm just giving you an example. And you saw me doing that. Then you'll all internalize to some, you'll create an antibody response to running ads. Or, you know, if, like I have this great fear of, um, you know, creating too much short form content, whatever it is, right? Like those responses to threats, they will determine how you respond as well. So the antibody level is set by how the founders respond and how the leadership responds. The gravity of response. So sometimes I respond, I respond really aggressively or unnecessarily over dramatic about some things because I'm also trying to set, I'm also trying to show you guys what the antibody response to this is, right? And I'm hoping that you mimic some of this antibody response. Uh, the more harsh the initial response to an event by the founder, the better the antibody response from the team the next time. After a long period of not facing a particular threat, the antibody response cools off. We forget that this is a threat in the first place. That is why constant vaccinations are required, i.e. constantly reminding people of the specific neg negative instances and the rules formed because of that. Culture and tradition are actually because of these things. Just so you know. In the real world, we, we form this because we're like, bro, all this keeps happening again and again, so let's ban this in our culture. And let's constantly show people, let's constantly sacrifice some people. I'm making a video on Girard's mimetic desires. It'll cover some of this, and this is just from the antibody lens. You can see that from the philosophy lens of how people interact with each other in real world and you know how society actually minim has to minimize desire. We'll come to that later, but anyway, next slide. Okay, the immune system responds to threats with inflammation. If someone's being toxic, and you guys, let's say four of you decide to take action against it, it creates conflict in the company, yeah? It's gonna reduce the amount of work you do. Correct? Because there's conflict now. There's always a little inflammation going on in your body right now. If you poop right now, and you see the number of inflammatory cells, there'll be a small number. So constant inflammation in your gut is normal, constant inflammation in your mouth is normal. Um, startups are always constantly fighting tiny battles. So there's always a little bit of irritation in everyone in the company with somebody else they're working with or something. A little bit of redness is there. The trick is not to completely eliminate it. Because if you completely eliminate it, people start tolerating bad behavior. But the question is how much of this inflammation you keep. Too much toxic environment, too little, the company dies. Too, too lax environment, toxicity takes over. So what's the right balance? People believe that companies can run with zero inflammation are wrong. Too much is of course a recipe for disaster. Sometimes it's abnormal, sometimes it's autoimmune, okay? Autoimmunity is when your immune system starts attacking healthy tissue by mistakenly recognizing them as invaders. This sometimes happens because of founder quirks where founders don't like something inside the company, which is totally normal. But you've created maladaptive behaviors because of it. So I have to be so, that's the thing about being a founder, right? You have to be so clear about your flaws. Like, shit, I do that very often. I should stop doing that in front of people. Right? It's very, very important. Otherwise, your team starts creating antibodies against it. Company context, autoimmunity when certain rules are bad rules and they're applied religiously. Just like antibody formation to healthy tissues and disease like arthritis, you must be very careful as a founder of what you attack and also think through the second order issues. Next slide. We we'll take this instance as an example. Maybe a manager fired an employee. And this is an actual instance that has happened in our company, okay? Let's say a manager fired an employee. And the team says, 
the employee reports it to the HR as it's an abuse of power. Okay, and it's been very non-specific, vague about it. Now, abuse of power is a term that encompasses a lot of things. It could be sexual abuse of power, definitely not something we can say okay to. It could be a power trip. Now, power trip is very subjective. Or it could be somebody that wanted to get something done and was fed up with the employee and said, shut up, please do this. Right? So, there are many different ways to see it. Also, you have to then look at the wording. Was it shut up or was it fuck you? Right? So, you really have to dive deep into this. But let's say you decide not to do that. Because what happens, and I've seen this, I first saw this in my Discord because it got to scale. And it also so random things start happening, right? Because when you do this, it gets misinterpreted very quickly. And people come up with their own narrative. Oh, this is what happened. Okay? And you don't have time to look into the truth because 50 people are pissed off with you because they're like, if you don't take a decision and fire this person, we're going to leave. Or whatever. And you think this, this has not, never happened in our company, but this happens very often in other companies. Then you have a choice. Okay, as a founder. And this is the hard choice that many of you as mid-level management, many of you that will eventually become management will have to take. Okay, let's assume this abuse of power didn't actually happen, but you decide to fire the manager anyway to appease the crowd. Okay? All the other managers see this. You know what happens? Now all the other managers get scared. I have seen this happen in real time where a manager did nothing wrong. Employee got angry, went out, did some social media posts, this, that, whatever. And now the manager is scared to even hire or work with new employees. I'm like, yo, this is, we can't work like this. Employees unconsciously think this is unacceptable behavior for a manager to shout at this thing. And now the actual context of the words disappears. It's just, okay, any, any sort of raising voice or any sort of slightly come, come on Saturday, it starts extending, what is, is what I've seen, right? Uh, other managers avoid firing employees. Other managers uh, avoid firing trouble. There are troublesome managers, also troublesome employees, but managers start getting scared. Okay, for fear of being reprimanded, now you're in trouble. You're attacking your managers, which is healthy tissue. As a company, you have decided the antibody response against your managers, and it's not a good response, and it becomes maladaptive, and as a company, you suffer. Okay, you can't fix it, because the system supports the problem. This is how it's always been done. Now, let's take the flip side. If, your managers, if you let your managers actually abuse talent, you're autoimmune against talent. Right? You have the exact same problem again. Good people will leave when injustice takes place. So actually, being autoimmune to talent is worse than being autoimmune to managers. Right? So you need to set rules that are favorable. And this is the hard part of running a company. You need to set rules that are favorable to both sides with the window or the gap for managers to have slightly, just slightly more power than employees to get stuff done. It makes sense. We all understand this. We all know this. Anyone who's ever run a team, anyone who's ever run a company knows this. But social media has forgotten this now. So setting that right amount, this 2 to 3% tolerance to some mild ba bad behavior, defining exactly what that slightly mild bad behavior is, and bad is also subjective there. But defining that behavior, very hard. You can't. It's very situational. Oh, the guy didn't pick me up on his bike and he just left me in the rain in the middle of the night. Is that bad behavior? Depends on how the story is told and how it's interpreted, it can. Right? So, um, the immune system privilege, for example, brain and eyes have much more immune system privilege, right? The antibodies don't actually attack your eyes. There are some exceptions, but eyes are protected. They have immune privilege. So your leadership needs to have a little more immune privilege because of the same reasons. Um, yeah, next slide. Yeah, with VC-funded startups, you actually end up with a lot of autoimmunity. Because the founder just says, there's a problem, but I'll raise the next round and I'll just fire all these people. I'll hire a new set of people. So you can't run a company like that. You can't say, I'll, I'll just cut this cancer out later. So one of the things I've started doing these days, if you notice, is I started repeating the same thing over and over again. And there's a reason for it because I'm trying to set the right antibody responses. If we've forgotten you know, some threat, I'm constantly trying to remind people of the threat. It's, it's kind of my job at this point. Um, okay, and remember, the cost of you mounting an exaggerated response, me being over-exaggerated about some stupid thing, is a fever. It's unnecessary inflammation, redness in the short term, but it's important because it sets the long-term immunity to a problem. Uh, sometimes, and this is the last point I want to bring to, is I've seen companies go through a coup. A coup is how you pronounce it, actually. These are like cancers, where some cells will band together, form a movement to replace current management. I've seen this often in other companies. We saw this open OpenAI recently, right? Um, as a founder, you should be watchful of these. Um, weak immune systems, where you're not attacking those unhealthy cells, they actually cause cancer. If you take immune suppressants now, your propensity for getting cancer is much higher. 
right? Because T cells are not destroying cancer cells in the early days. Uh, T cells are a type of immune cell. So you need to watch out for these coups as manager and you need to stop them because they never work. They only destroy the company. Even though the people on the other end think they're doing the right thing. Cancer cell probably doesn't think it's evil. And it's technically not evil, it's just nature, right? Um, but to you as the human being facing cancer, it is evil. Awesome, next slide. Awesome, so I just have closing thoughts after this. I'm just gonna summarize everything I said. Let's do it very quickly. Brain and the eyes find fertile, low competitive ground. The founder pumps glucose, which is leads and oxygen cash to the team. Organs consume oxygen and food. The central nervous system consumes the most resources. The company's immune system prevents autoimmunity and cancers. Uh, pick battles wisely, battle always takes a toll on you. Find lands with lower competition. You want the founders and founders' time and effort into the company to reduce over the long term, where in the first one or two years, the founder has to work the hardest. If the company dies, then the founder has to work harder again to build the next one. If it doesn't, it has to, tr the goal is to try and get into orbit. Um, beware stiffness of arteries at scale. Um, beware things leaking across the blood-brain barrier. Don't do fraud, it's like smoking cigarettes. Uh, it makes the entire oxygen system sort of tarnished. Um, so all your cash flow, you don't know if it's like some fraud cash or not. It's not a good thing to do. Uh, remote work tends to slow down the feedback loop of uh, the peripheral to central nervous system. So try not to be remote. Uh, learn to run lean, which is capable of sinking lots of glucose on low amounts of oxygen. Um, learn to grow crops. Distribution, you know, don't go to Facebook and Google tables, even though obviously they're doing a good job and you should be exposed to them to some extent, but try to build it on your own. And you're still building it on their platform so they don't lose much or they will pivot and figure out a way to make money of that. Chop wood, carry water after your farm is made. Build processes that do not require too much manual intervention. Next slide. Uh, partner with allies, weak mon monkeys partner with weak monkeys to take down stronger monkeys. Uh, you can only afford to have no allies if you're number one and nobody is really number one. Uh, avoid revealing your territory map to others. Immature cells differentiate into specialized cells b based on their microenvironment. So learning is best when people are sitting next to each other versus you know, in like a formal knowledge transfer. Uh, constantly reset the level of autoimmunity. Eliminate pathogenic antibodies. Introduce antibodies to bad behavior. PR is not real distribution. You don't own it. PR is not real distribution. You don't own it. Grow crops. Don't become a foodie, which means don't get too uh, addicted to carbohydrates and short form content. Try to create long form content. Uh, government is like chieftain, big, burly, strong. Uh, better to play at one arm's distance in case he wants the farm later. Uh, study those who own farms and are fat. Um, most content creators are vain, self-absorbed, and know no end to their ego uh, because they've not run a company, but they're genuinely really good at farming. They're really, really, really good at not just engagement farming, but also building their own distribution. Learn from them. Uh, I've studied many of these top content creators. That's why we know what we know today. Uh, but some of them do a really good job. They work because they have very low costs also. Like a content creator's costs are very, very low compared to a business's costs, right? Adipose tissue, which is fat, is the cost of high glucose levels and lack of exercise. So keep doing it. Um, it's very hard to run when there's an emergency and of course increases glucose levels and worsens oxygen requirements. You can tolerate some inflammation at organs like skin. You can't tolerate it at the heart or the brain. Inflammation at the brain level, sometimes you know you get multiple sclerosis and the myelin sheets break. All right, so that's about it. Um, it's a very weird way of looking at companies and it's something I wrote many years ago. Not all of it may, may fit your experience. Uh, it's worked well for us. So I thought good to make a video about it for people online, good to tell my team. Uh, yeah, and I think almost everything I told you makes obvious sense to you today. But to the people watching, and when you actually see this video online, you realize it doesn't make so much sense to them. Be like, what? They'll have their own reasons for why it does not make sense to them. But the truth is, it works for you because you've seen some of the outputs of this. So that's why I could have made this deck, I mean, I could have presented this one and a half years ago, but I was like, first, let us use this to make progress, then show people. Right? So I think that's the cool part. I hope you guys liked it, watching online. Bye!